chapter 20 conclusion and now what must be our opinion of Napoleon and his relations with women we must consider these in double aspect first as purely material secondly as combined of the moral and the material or rather as the material expression of moral influences we have made no attempt to gloss over those commonplace adventures in which the senses alone were concerned not that they throw any particular light upon napoleon's character but had we concealed them it might have been supposed that they were specially damaging to his reputation secrecy was out of the question for one in napoleon's position careful as he was to veil all such passing intrigues and mystery ladies of the palace waiting women aides de camp and valets were always on the watch taking note of the most insignificant events in the same manner all who lived within the zone of government around the tuileries all who were scheming for favors or collecting gossip duly registered any rumors that came to their ears and as napoleon's slightest actions have become history as no details of his daily life even to the casual variations of his health have been found too insignificant for the public whose interest and curiosity seem to have been stimulated rather than sated by a century of comment all contemporary witnesses no matter how dubious have found credence pamphleteers have drawn largely upon them for the support of their various theses and the most erroneous theories have been accepted these it is only possible to refute by setting forth the actual facts in a plain unvarnished record of all such adventures as rest on the synthetic narratives of several contemporary witnesses. If we have neglected others or noted them but in passing in spite of their probable authenticity, it has been either because they are recorded only by one irresponsible chronicler whose testimony lacks documentary corroboration or because they were in themselves so trivial and commonplace that comment on them would have been but a repetition of facts already noted what conclusions are we to draw from adventures of this nature simply that napoleon was a man that he was 30 years old in 1799 that he was 40 in 1809 and that he had made no vows of chastity women were ready to offer themselves at the slightest sign made by him or by others for him he took them with more or less of satisfaction in the intrigue but with little self-abandonment his brain remained clear and active his faculty for strenuous mental labor unimpaired no woman was ever corrupted by him some among them may have been chased to there too but these were for the most part astute virgins whose virtue was a commodity they were willing to sell at a price broadly speaking these women whether of the theater or the court whether married or unmarried were courtesans their love was a marketable commodity he bought them on their own terms and duly paid for his bargain sensuality can hardly be laid to his charge for sensuality implies the refinement of pleasure he on the other hand wasted little time in dalliance his wooing was abrupt and peremptory he has been called brutal where perhaps he might be more justly described as hurried and preoccupied he took such distractions hastily as he took his meals in his case they were rather concession to the weaknesses of the flesh than an indulgence in voluptuous habits or a realization of sensuous dreams was such conduct an outrage upon the laws of morality we may ask what laws of morality if these vary with latitudes how much more with epics it is obviously absurd to test the men of the empire notably the emperor himself by the smug standards of contemporary middle-class morality in their wild career throughout europe under a perpetual hail of shot and shell where every man rode with death on the crupper a few may have carried mistresses in their train whose presence was carefully concealed from the emperor but the large majority of them lived heartily and chastely throughout a camp Campaign, if it be true that at the close of a long war or when they entered a conquered town they sometimes broke out into a fierce and riotous debauch 
it can it be denied that the most virtuous citizen of modern times is less continent than the most reckless of these men did not the very calling inclination had led them to adopt and ambition had forced them to retain marked them out as types of brutal and primitive humanity had not their career naturally tended to foster and exasperate the savage instinct of combativeness and consequently of animalism because because they were soldiers, were they therefore exempt from the tastes, the needs, the appetites of other men? And could it be expected that monogamous scruples would so far compel a man of this breed as to keep him invariably faithful to an absent wife? Some indeed attain even to this chaste ideal. Strange evidences are extant of such constancy among these men of iron. There were lovers whose hearts were capable of all the delicate fidelity attributed by romancers of the great Cyrus himself. Others, however, allowed themselves greater license. They took no account of such camp courtships and could not look upon them as infidelities. Neither could they think with much compunction of the passing intrigues they occasionally indulged in in Paris adventures of an hour concealed with so much care that in many cases they were never heard of until after the death of the principal actors even these lax spirits combined with their grosser animality a vein of sentimental fancy and conjugal tenderness nothing was too rich too beautiful too rare for the woman nearly every one among them had married for love without a thought of self-interest they pillaged europe to gratify the caprices of these women and cast the spoils at their feet they sought to win their smiles by a tact a patience and a situation of devotion which might move to laughter did it not rather incline the tears that napoleon yielded to none among them in devotion to his wife his letters his presence the enormous fortune he settled upon her sufficiently proved but the strain of sentimentality in his character was wholly different they whom neither nature nor education had endowed with scruples evolved a code of conduct for themselves the basis of which was what they called honor the honor of soldiers differing in many respects from that which montesquieu describes as the appanage of gentlemen though they indeed held that their swords had made them the equals of the best in the land they could not however find precedents on which to base their rules in their own times and they had little reverence for de la zunes and tillies of past generation they still hated those whose places they had taken and disdained to ape their manners claiming equality not so much with them as with the ancestors of the noblest among them these ancestors were the crusaders and here we find the key to the extraordinary success of what was known as the troubadour movement under the first empire where must we look for the first impulse which set this stream of tendency in motion was it literature which created the romantic idea in the minds of men or the romantic idea reflecting itself from those minds in the literature of their day it matters little which what it behooves us to see is it never did art or literature respond more readily to national sentiment nor exercise a deeper influence on national manners an influence most potent and vivid perhaps in its action on minds that could boast little previous culture in 1806 the troubadour movement was at its height in france novels history the theater pictures and costume alike proclaimed its sway the troubadour himself however counted for far less in the matter than the knight whose exploits the troubadour had sung the knight who professed the worship of his lady and claimed as the sole reward of his exploits in the holy land of infidels slaughtered dragons overcome cities won from a foe a scarf of her colors to wear in battle and a glance from her bright eyes the warriors of the empire all endeavor to model themselves upon this ideal and imaginary knight if they did not find a scar for their ladies colors across their breasts hundreds of them carried on their swords a tassel embroidered by beloved hands or a portrait of her next to their hearts and decked themselves before a battle with some love token napoleon felt the influence of the movement less than many of his comrades he was not carried away by it like his stepson Ushad and some of his marshals, but neither was he altogether unmoved by this manifestation of the age, as we may judge 
by many details of his relations with Marie Louise. This, however, was not until the close of the empire when a feeling hitherto unknown to him had begun to dominate and efface all others. Up to this time, his sentimentality owed nothing to the new literature, but much, indeed all, to that of the last generation. It was Rousseau, and Rousseau alone, who gave Napoleon his sentimental education. According to Josephine, he loved three women only, herself, Madame du Chatel, and Madame Valeska. His letters both to Josephine and Madame Valeska are pure Rousseau. In his recorded conversations with them, we also recognize the tone of young Lieutenant Bonaparte's writing. In the phrases, the very words in which he lamented his solitude and poverty of Alette's, those reflections on the illusions and emptiness of life flow from the same source, the same sufferings inspired in him the same dreams on three different occasions. As Rousseau's pupil, he seems to have so saturated himself with the spirit of the master that he made it his own, and he who had attempted everything and achieved the impossible in the world of realities was impressed by impotence, negation, and disgust in the realm of sentiment. It may be indeed that though Rousseau's influence is apparent in the inception expression of his youthful sentiment, his moral temperature developed independently on these lines and received but a slight bias from literature. In his aspirations after the woman who would love him for himself alone be absolutely his thinking of none but him and vying with him in the interchange of mutual tenderness. He was undoubtedly sincere, but we may ask how far he unconsciously adopted the tone of his literary memories and how far he constrained himself to feel sensations which he supposed to be rare and novel, that such a strain of exaltation was in some degree forced is shown, I think, by the fact that he soon wearied of it. It did not bring him the joys he had hoped for. The woman he loved or imagined he loved fell short of the ideal he had created. Some incident roused his suspicions and caused a revulsion of feeling. All was over. His acquired sentimentality vanished in the light of his keen and practical natural sense, but he turned at once to a fresh experience in which he found a deep and enduring satisfaction. In a man such as this, we may well wonder at the fidelity, not indeed of his senses, but of his heart. He was unfaithful to Josephine. He had mistresses, some of whom he loved fondly and sincerely, with whom he sounded all the depths as well as all the puerilities of sentiment. Yet throughout he retained such lasting tenderness, such real affection, such indestructible passion for the woman who had held the first place in his heart that he could forget all she had thought, done, and said against him. He did not forgive he obliterated it. He could dismiss as though they had never been all those details of treachery of which we can hardly suppose him to have been ignorant. Her lovers, her finality, her debts. He remembered only that the woman he had raised to the proudest place in Europe, whom he had called to the throne and consecrated by the hands of the Pope, whom he had associated with the most stupendous of destinies, was grace and charm personified. He invested her with good qualities and even with virtues. He decked her with all the graces the most passionate lover could attribute to his mistress if he found fault with her extravagance. His very reproaches spoke of love, for he had given her the means to gratify her prodigal tastes. The true character of this woman, over whom he threw a mantle of immortality due to the glamour she exercised on him, and his unreal conception of all pertaining to her, was so entirely unknown to him that if he deceived posterity about her, it was because he was himself deceived. The illusion persisted till his death. At St. Helena, she still appeared to his eyes, his heart, and his senses. The Josephine, whom General Vendemire saw for the first time in the little house of Rue Chateran, the Josephine of Milan, and of Momello, and the first, the only woman, it might almost be said, who let loose the stores of passion in his breast and taught him to know and rejoice in love. Josephine was throughout rather a mistress and a wife. He loved, but he did not respect her. His passion exacting, masterful, and intemperate had in it a touch of half-contemptuous cynicism, which made it easy for him to pour out powerless confidences, to confess his own fatalities, infidelities, to ask her help in breaking off a connection that had become irksome. Their intercourse towards and partook of the free and easy familiarity of a quondam lover and his former mistress. At every turning point in his career, he recognized the expediency of putting an end to a connection which was 
not a marriage in his eyes. He felt that he could not go on forever, that it was time for him to have done with it and form more serious ties. His superstitious conscience was easily persuaded that a marriage without the blessing of the church was no marriage and that the tardy ceremony of eight years later was invalidated by the compulsion under which he consented to it. Yet, had a child been born of their union, he would have held the contract, such as it was, to be binding. He would have recognized his obligations, but no child, no contract. In his parting with Josephine, he maintained the same attitude. He offered her the consolations proper to a discarded mistress, plenty of money, a life of ease and opulence. In spite of his unconquerable weakness for this woman, in spite of his lavish generosity to her, his adoption of her children, the exalted positions to which he raised from nieces and cousins, we may doubt whether Napoleon ever looked upon her as belonging to his family. When we see how different was his feeling for her to that he developed after his marriage with Marie Louise, especially when Marie Louise had given him a son. After his second marriage, the conjugal spirit took possession of him and modified his whole character. His love for Marie Louise had little of the passion with which Josephine had inspired him. Her attraction for him was that of the wife and not of the mistress. He felt that an infidelity to her would be an unpardonable offense, and his f infrequent lapses were concealed with a care that bore witness to his respect for his marriage vows. He indulged in no intimacies and took part in no amusements his wife did not share. It was commonly reported that his delay in undertaking the settlement of affairs in Spain was caused by his reluctance to leave her. He had originally excluded Josephine from any participation in the government of the empire, but he called upon Marie Louise to share his power and made her regent. He gave her credit for more intelligence, judgment, reason, and he discerned in his oldest counselors or any of his brothers. He treated her thus not only because she was the mother of his son, though this no doubt had to wait with him, but because he felt for her that conjugal respect he had never felt for Josephine. Whereas to Josephine... He was always the lover, even after her death to Marie Louise, he was always the husband. The sentimental education he had received from Rousseau influenced all his relations with the former, with the latter, his Corsican atavism, the old tradition of his mountains reasserted itself, heightened no doubt to some extent by assimilation of the monarchic idea. He worshipped the wife, sanctified and sublimated by the mother. He would not admit that his wife had abandoned him. He refused to know that she was false to him. Being his wife, he supposed her beyond the reach of ordinary temptation. So strong was this conjugal loyalty in him that he maintained it to the end, as we know from his will. He whose jealousy was so inordinate that he complained bitterly of Madame Dordano's marriage, had only words of praise and tenderness for Marie Louise. Was this merely an extreme application of the monarchic principle in the respect to crown heads? Or was he anxious to keep up his own allusion to the last? Did he make special allowance for the weaknesses of the Archduchess? Or did he suppose that the secret he guarded to the end would be respected by history? There may have been a mingling of all these influences in his mind, but above all, he was silent because she was his wife and his wife was above suspicion setting aside those purely physical distractions of which we have spoken we recognize in napoleon a faculty for love as great as was his faculty for thought or action we see him to have been no less extraordinary as lover and husband then as warrior and statesman, as a husband, he suffered in silence to save his wife from the obloquy of posterity and from 1815 to 1821 consistently played a part to preserve her honor. He showed that he could be faithful, tender, and respectful. He could lay aside his imperious mood and woo her with all the timid flatteries of a youthful husband jealous as he was by temperament he was able so far to control himself as to conceal his feelings entirely in his wife's presence and to affect the most perfect confidence in her devotion when an ocean lay between them and she had forsaken and betrayed him as a lover he was even more abnormal if we consider the strength of his passions and the amativity if we may be allowed the word which he developed there was not a note in the gamut of human passion he did not sound passing from the fury of sensual and physical desire to the most suave and delicate 
phases of sentimental emotion. Nothing escaped him. Nothing was unknown to him in the whole range of amorous sensation. And as far as he himself was concerned, from the personal and egotistic point of view, he was an ideal lover. Women perhaps judged him differently, and with the generality of them, he seems to have been capable of arousing an antagonism so pronounced that it may be questioned whether he was ever really loved. For women can really love the man in whom they recognize their master, the superior who bends them to his will and refuses to bow to theirs, who lays the impress of his mind upon them and declines to confirm to their opinions, who can know that he is truly loved? Is it not enough to have loved, to have tasted all the delights of love to a degree undreamt by a lesser man? We have one last question to consider. Did any of the women loved by Napoleon, whether as husband or lover, exercise an appreciable influence in his policy? Did they so far sway his mind as to determine his public action? We can find no trace of direct intervention, either on the part of wife or mistress, but it is indisputable that the impressions he received of and from several among them, his conversations with them, the circumstances connected with certain liaisons, led to the conception of new ideas, the modification of old ones, and even to the determination of his course in certain crises of his career. Passionately as he loved her, Josephine is now foremost among the women to whom we may trace the genesis of certain political resolutions. It would be an error to conceive of her as stimulating his social ambition by attracting the old nobility to his cause and inducing him occasionally to sacrifice the spirit of the revolution to the traditions of the ancient order. It was he himself who was bent on gaining the aristocrats at the price as it proved of being sold and betrayed by them. Josephine recruited among them by his orders. Josephine distributed his bounty but this was because he thought it would come better from her hands and produce a more favorable impression. As a matter of policy, he allowed reversals of decrees against emigrants, restitution of estates, and all such favors as he thought likely to dispose nobles and great ladies to gratitude or at least neutrality to pass through Josephine's hands. But to such measures, he was himself inclined and except on those rare occasions when he was taken by surprise, he only allowed such favors to be solicited as he had already made up his mind to grant, his kingly instinct was not sufficiently pronounced to make him take pleasure in repulsing a weeping woman, begging for the life of her husband or brother, a few useful hints together with many false impressions and indications more or less exact seemed to be all he owed to Josephine socially, but to others we may trace directly or indirectly some of the most decisive acts of his career. When Mademoiselle Denwell de la Plaine became pregnant by him, he made up his mind to the divorce and the approaching birth of Madame Valeska's child finally confirmed him in this determination. A new light is thrown upon his whole policy in connection with Poland when we remember who was his mistress in 1807, 1808, and 1809. Again, his extraordinary forbearance to Bernadotte is clearly referable to his early affection for Desiree. As soon as he had become the husband of Marie Louise and through her a member of the Austrian royal family, he considered the ties thus formed as close and durable as those those which bound him to his own family, hence that confident reliance on the continued friendship and support of Austria, which was his own undoing, if his sense of family obligations was so strong that he relied on them alone to cement political alliances, as he undoubtedly did in his negotiations with Bavaria, Baden, and Wurttemberg, to say nothing of Austria. It is hardly surprising that the conjugal spirit should have dominated him so absolutely. Nor can we wonder that Marie Louise, not by direct intervention, but by virtue of the place he accorded her in his combinations and the prestige with which he surrounded her, should have exercised an unprecedented influence on his policy both at home and abroad. Would he have been a man had it been otherwise? Was it not because he was keenly susceptible to the highest feelings of humanity, because he retained a faithful and tender recollection of his first love, because he had the family instincts of his race and the conjugal devotion enjoyed by monogamic morality? that his downfall was so stupendous and so irreparable. If woman had played no part in his life, Napoleon would not have been what he is. 
is most complete and extraordinary type of masculine genius on record. He would have been a something sexless and supernatural, a being in whom humanity could feel no interest because he had neither shared its passions nor followed its traditions. Whereas he, whose intellectual powers were greater than those of any man before or after him, who rising to the level of his extraordinary fortunes, found in his mighty mind resources equal to his splendid opportunities, and who accomplished the grandest task ever undertaken by mortal, was essentially a man to whom no human emotion was unknown. It is human to feel the influence of woman, to love her, to believe in her, to experience every sentiment and sensation she can inspire and here as in all other phases of character napoleon was the superior of other men the end <laughs>